So our first speaker this evening is Brandon Hauer, a PhD candidate here at the U of A. Uh, Brandon works in the Brain Rhythms Lab um, as part of the Neuroscience and Mental Health Institute and is co-supervised by Drs. Uh, Clay Dixon and Sylvia Pagliardini. His research interests are in network neurophysiology, specifically in how electrical activity uh, in various memory-related brain structures is coordinated during sleep and sleep-like states. Uh, so he uses a variety of cutting-edge technologies, such as optical and pharmacological techniques, to get at the root of his questions. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Brandon Hauer. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks very much for that. I'm going to try to share the screen and, and Hopefully this is working. <clears throat> Hopefully you all can, can see this uh, as intended. Um, I will take the silence to mean yes, because I can't actually see any of you. Um, but thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and welcome everyone to a, a very special um, NMHI public lecture, uh, the very first online one. So that's, uh, that's a unique privilege for you. Um, as Britt said, I am Brandon Howard. I'm going to be talking to you today about the tremendous and varied benefits of, deep sleep, of sleep, and especially deep sleep. Uh, except as it turns out during the next 20 minutes or so, uh, during which it turns out it's very bad for you to sleep, so try not to. Um, a little bit more about me and about why I'm here before we delve in. Um, I am uh, a PhD candidate here uh, at the U of A studying neuroscience, co-supervised by Drs. Clayton Dixon and Sylvia Pajardini, and I am super interested in how sleep and memory might be related. So the idea, the rather old idea, that if you studied something and then slept on it, you might remember it better. And I'm really interested in mechanistically why that might be. How is it that you can actually have that kind of sleep and memory benefit going on? And so I use an animal model for this uh, to study this kind of sleep and sleep related physiology. So before we go much further, I have to, to start with, you know, what is sleep? Uh, it's a kind of tricky thing to define, but we can start by saying that sleep has to be vital for existence. As one prominent sleep scientist, Alan Rutschoffen, once said, if sleep doesn't serve an absolutely vital function, it is the biggest mistake evolution ever made. There's, you know, there, there can't be a reason that you would just fall asleep for eight hours and be susceptible to prey and not productive and not eating. Um, there has to be something going on. And we, we think this is the case, especially because everything sleeps. Every animal that we have studied carefully sleeps or has some analog for sleep, whether it's a lizard, a mammal like us, birds, insects, honeybees, everything sleeps or, or has something like it. And so if I asked you to define sleep, you might describe things like, oh, I'm laying down and it's dark, or you know, I'm in my seventh hour of Zoom meetings on any given day. But there's perhaps a more rigorous and scientific way to actually look at things here. And so we can say that it's a behavioral state defined first by less responsive to stimuli. Perhaps that's intuitive because you're generally not responding to things while you're actually asleep. Next, we can say there's a, there's a typical posture. So if you said you'd be laying down, you'd be typically correct, unless you're some kind of vampire, I suppose. There'd be less motor activity. Generally, we don't want you moving around while you sleep, uh, and it's not advantageous to do so. And fourth, there's distinct electrical brain activity. And so this is something we'll be talking about quite a bit today. Um, electrical activity, you could say, is kind of the currency of the brain. Basically, everything that your brain is doing relies on electrical signals uh, propagated between the neurons in your brain. There's always electrical communication going on. And we can look at that and, and learn some very interesting things about sleep in both ourselves and in animals. So related to that electrical activity, one way we can look at that is with EEG, which you may have heard of, which stands for electroencephalogram. And that looks a little bit something like this. Um, I, if I bring up a laser pointer here, <clears throat> hopefully you can see my cursor. This is an example of someone who has an EEG cap on. So basically they have this this tight fitting mesh cap with little circles on it, and these are electrodes and little wires that will feed into some kind of computer. And what we can do is record all of the summed electrical potentials that are going on, all the electrical activity going on in your brain, just from the level of the scalp. And if we were to do that, put this cap on someone who's awake, like this woman presumably is, what we would see is this kind of activity. So this squiggly line here is the kind of summed activity at any one of these electrodes. So you can see it's very kind of random looking uh, squiggly activity. It's low voltage or low amplitude, which you can see is from bottom to top. That's what I mean when I say amplitude, how big the signal actually is. It's kind of random. It's not particularly the rhythmic. There's lots going on. But as you start to get a little bit more drowsy and, and enter early sleep, so say you've had your socially distanced Thanksgiving dinner, you've had your turkey and you're, you're in your favorite armchair, and what you're, you're starting to nod off, but you're not completely asleep yet. What you see is that the electrical activity on average slows down. You get a little bit more slow activity, a little bit more rhythmic activity. 
And as you actually fall completely asleep, what we see is this trend continues. You get more rhythmic and larger amplitude activity that gets nice and slow, nice and rhythmic as you keep falling asleep. In stage three sleep, this is this very deep kind of sleep where you see the biggest kind of amplitude and the most rhythmic slow activity across much of the brain. Now, these stages one, two, and three refer to stages of NREM or non-rapid eye movement sleep, um, quite simply because they are not rapid eye movements. And so I bring that up because the last kind of, of sleep here is, is REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, so-called because your eyes move very quickly during this. And this is conventionally known as dreaming sleep. This is the kind of sleep that you would have when you're actually experiencing a lot of dreams, but your muscles are all paralyzed temporarily so that you can't move and act out those dreams. It's called paradoxical sleep sometimes because of how paradoxically it looks like you're awake. Despite being such a deep stage of sleep, you can see this low voltage random kind of squiggly activity looks very much like it does when you're awake. And that's a lot of what dreaming is. It's, it's reenacting things while you sleep, just while not being able to move around. Really what I want to get out of this, or what I want you to say if you get out of this, is that sleep is active. It's not as though your brain just turns off and these are all just flat lines. There's lots of things going on constantly in your brain, especially while you sleep. Now, these different states perhaps imply that different things are going on. Maybe your brain is doing something different with each of these, sleep, each of these stages. We can see that, generally speaking, as you get into deeper and deeper sleep, these rhythms slow down and get more synchronized uh, the, more, the more deep you go. And what I'm really interested in and what we're talking a lot about today is slow wave sleep. So slow wave sleep is this stage three non-rapid eye movement sleep, again, with these nice slow waves. It's so-called because these are very slow waves across much of your brain, slow rhythmic activity. So this is a different way <clears throat> to look at, at sleep. And so this is a, a, a typical night sleep for someone and, and looking at the different sleep states. So on the bottom here, what you're seeing is hours of sleep. And this person has a seemingly implausible, perfect eight hour sleep. And on the y-axis here, what we can see is stage W is wake. That's when the person is awake. So they're awake here and they fall asleep and they wake up a couple times here. Then stage R, this big black bar is REM sleep. So this is again, your dreaming sleep. And then the stages N1, N2, and N3 with slow wave sleep being at the very bottom. And so what you can see just kind of general trend in this, this hypnogram word of the day is this, a lot of slow wave sleep early on in the night, kind of the first half of your sleep, you're getting a, a lot more of this slow wave sleep. And later in the night, you're getting a lot more REM sleep, a lot more of this dreaming kind of sleep, this paradoxical activity. Uh, and we'll be talking a bit more about that later on, but it's an interesting thing to note that it's not as though all these sleep rhythms are just happening one after another. There's a certain kind of pa uh, pattern to them. So when I started my degree, I had a, a pretty simple question about, you know, how does sleep affect memory? And so perhaps the most intuitive way we could look at this is say, okay, well, if you don't sleep, how does that affect your memory? And so the experiment here would be pretty simple. You compare sleep-deprived people to people who aren't sleep-deprived. If we were to block this out, it would look a little something like this. You have someone who's awake all day, and before they go to bed, they're trained on some test. They're saying, okay, remember all of these facts, and then good night, see you later, they go to sleep. They wake up in the morning, and they're tested. Say, how well do you recall all those things you were trained on? And you compare all these people to people who go through their day just like the others did, are trained, but then instead of going to sleep, they just quietly rest. They just relax and they're awake the whole time and don't sleep. And then they're tested at the same time the next day. And what we found is that sleep deprivation decreases memory. These people perform worse on that task. And that's perhaps intuitive, but it's not the best kind of study. It's tricky to do because if you were forced to be awake all night, you'd be less alert, you'd be fatigued, you could be stressed. There's a whole lot of things going on here that aren't just sleep related. So, Maybe a better way to do this is to look at if you just added a little extra sleep rather than take sleep away. And so we can do that. We could do a similar kind of setup, except instead of depriving people, we just give some group an extra little nap. So plotted similarly, this would look uh, kind of like this. So basically, the morning someone goes about their day and then is trained on something and then has a little afternoon siesta, and then they're tested on. So how well do you recall all the things you learned before? This is a group who goes about their day and then just quietly relaxes, sits in an armchair, doesn't fall asleep, and then is tested at the same time. And what we can see is that the sleep, the nap group, actually helps for memories, which is perhaps surprising if you consider that if you were sitting in the armchair, you could be sitting there thinking, okay, here's what I learned. Let me really rehearse this in my mind. It seems like there's something special going on in sleep that actually helps you form these memories. 
is there a particular element of sleep that allows this to occur? What, what is it about sleep that's letting you actually form these memories? We know that there's different stages now, the different kind of NREM stages and non-REM. So is there something going on there that that helps explain what's going on, something that's better for memory? Well, if you recall our hypnogram, word of the day, early on we see lots of this slow wave sleep. And some very clever people devised an experiment where basically you train people before they go to bed and then wake them up halfway through the night. After they've had all of this really dense slow wave sleep early on, you test them on say, hey, what did you, what did you learn before and how well do you recall? And you compare these people against, if you'll recall, later in the night, you get a lot more dreaming sleep, a lot more REM sleep. And these people, you wake them up in the middle of the night, train them, and then they go back to sleep and are tested afterwards. So the whole idea is that you're testing a group who's had a lot of slow wave sleep versus a group who's had a lot of REM sleep or dreaming sleep. And it turns out it's this slow wave sleep that really helps improve memory, memory for facts and episodes, things that you actually didn't experience and learn. It seems to be the slow wave sleep in particular that's underlying this kind of memory bank. Why? Why would that be? Why, why would that happen? Why slow wave sleep? What's so special? And so one way to look at that is here we have a kind of classic cartoon of a human brain. <clears throat> so this is viewed inside profile. So from the side here, you have the front of the brain up here, back of the brain here, bottom down here. There are three structures that I really like, um, partly for their relation to memory, the hippocampus, the cerebral cortex, and the thalamus. Now, the hippocampus is one of the most widely studied brain areas because it's known to be tremendously important for memory. And so when you learn something, some kind of episode or fact, say a phone number, the hippocampus becomes very active. It's very important for that early kind of memory. But over time, through some kind of communication with the cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex being the kind of noodly bit that makes you smart on the outside of your brain, that memory can be made long term. It goes from you just know this, for, uh, this phone number for a short term to knowing it for months or years or even for the rest of your life, depending on how important the fact actually is. And so it's this, this transfer of information from the hippocampus, this kind of whole brain uh, area that seems to underlie this long term memory. But when is that happening? Well, it turns out that slow wave sleep is an ideal time to have this kind of information exchange between hippocampus and cerebral cortex. You have this slow rhythmic activity occurring in both the hippocampus and cerebral cortex, with much of the brain doing the exact same thing. And that kind of uh, slow rhythmic activity seems to be the ideal platform to exchange information, exchange ideas, make a memory go from a small area to a much larger area so that you can remember it for a lot longer of a time. Now, as a bit of a side note, I've also included the thalamus here, because the thalamus is something I'm really interested in for its role in coordinating the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus. So you go into slow wave sleep and I'm really interested in how, is this, how does the thalamus help them talk to each other? How, how is this communication served by the thalamus helping to coordinate these slow rhythms that could be responsible for forming memories? So is slow wave sleep good for anything else? We know now and hopefully you believe me that it's good for learning and memory. Um, but what else, you know? Well, it turns out that slow wave sleep is also good for getting a stock photo of you taken grinning at an alarm clock at six in the morning. But more than that, it's really good for cardiovascular and cognitive function. This, this study found that even just by taking short naps several times a week, you could improve both cardiovascular and brain function. Moreover, it's good for metabolism. It's good for alertness. It's good for behavioral performance. And these kind of go hand in hand with the idea that if you have some kind of complex task, even driving to work in the morning uh, or, you know, opening your Zoom meetings, I guess, as we have now. Um, slow wave sleep seems to be really important for a host of things that help you focus, help you uh, achieve optimal behavioral and physical function. Now, on the flip side, sleep deprivation, uh, conversely, can land you in this collage of people in very blue rooms looking forlornly at alarm clocks. And so we know there must be detriments because look at how sad these people are. And so Obviously, perhaps now there may be difficulty forming new memories. Hopefully, that's, uh, that's a little bit more intuitive. We know that slow wave sleep is this very important state for memory formation. But also, sleep loss can re result in increased stress, increased risk for obesity and diabetes, increased hunger and appetite, increased pain, and in fact, lower thresholds for pain, increased risk taking behavior, uh, decreased optimism and sociability. So, if you wake up in the morning and you don't have a good sleep, and you might say, oh, I really don't want to do this meeting kind of thing today. That might be why you might not have had enough slow wave sleep. There could be cardiovascular complications as well, or increased rate of mood and psychiatric disorders basically across the board. So 
sleep seems to be doing something fundamental, and especially deep sleep, fundamental across the board for every aspect of your, your daily life. But fear not, there are ways to improve your sleep. And one of the most, at least theoretically easy to do, is having a consistent sleep schedule. So the idea that you go to bed at a regular time each day and get up at a regular time in the morning, not oversleeping when you have to and not staying up much later than you have to because maybe there are new episodes of Wheel of Fortune on. Uh, I actually don't know if Wheel of Fortune is still on um, that you want to watch. But trying to force these habits and, and get used to doing the same thing every night can be really good for your sleep habits. Related to that is reserving your bedroom for sleep. So this study that I have here um, is actually looking at 15-year-olds in Alberta who had access to their phone while they were in bed versus those who did it. And perhaps intuitively, those with access to their phone had much worse uh, time to fall asleep and a much lower quality of sleep. And so it seems to be that if you reserve your bedroom just for sleep, you, know, you don't work in there as, as much as everyone has a home office now, trying to reserve your bedroom just for a time that your body can say, okay, it's time to go to sleep. I'm going to lay down and that's it. I'm not going to think about work. I'm not going to think about Instagram. I'm going to go to sleep. Another good way is regular exercise. Um, so regularly exercising throughout the week and over time uh, can help you fall asleep in, in terms of how quickly you do it. But this study found that even just brisk walking four times a week improved sleep quality, time to fall asleep, and sleep duration. Basically, across the board, regular exercise, which you may hear more about in the next talk, can really help sleep in a variety of ways. From our own lab, trying to manipulate slow wave sleep in different ways, we know that oxygen can promote deep restorative sleep. And so in this study, what we are doing is looking at as soon as we administered increased amounts of oxygen, even just by a few percent, you immediately saw a robust increase in slow wave sleep that lasted for as long as the oxygen was increased, and that went back to a kind of a regular rhythm afterwards, after we went back to normal kinds of oxygen. And conversely, if we lowered oxygen by just a little bit, just a few percent, like you'd have on an airplane, for example, you had a lot less slow wave sleep until afterwards when you went into a rebound state, lots of slow wave sleep. This other study here that I have looked at the effects of even just opening a window in your bedroom, which may not be feasible today, but trying to reduce carbon dioxide and increase oxygen content uh, can have actually help for a deep, slower sleep. Lastly, something I kept hearing about was blue light filters. You know, yeah, you got to turn your blue light filter on in your phone. And I wasn't actually sure if that was true, but it turns out it is. Blue light filters, such as those on your phone, and in fact, most electronic devices now have filter settings that you can have that makes the screen kind of a yellowish color by filtering out all the blue light. And that can actually reduce your time to fall asleep. And when I was curious about why, it turns out the blue light can actually reduce, especially frontal brain, slow wave activity. And so this is something you could start doing right now, tonight. You could go home from, from this talk, well, presumably you actually are already home, how about that? Uh, and turn on blue light filters on most of your devices, and perhaps you'd see over time an increased quality of sleep. Now, to, to kind of wrap up this talk with a bit more sci-fi as science reality now, there's a system from Philips called Smart Sleep and they build themselves as put your deep sleep to work. And so obviously that captured my and my lab's attention. And so what it looks like is this, this kind of funny looking backwards baseball hat that uh, you put on just before you go to sleep. And there are two small sensors in it uh, that record brain activity. So you put this on uh, nice and snug, it goes over your, your ears and your forehead and you fall asleep. And what those sensors are doing is recording your brain activity. So it can detect when you're on slow wave sleep. So if I bring up, um, this, this phone here, there's an app that goes with it and it can actually record your various sleep states. Like this. And so again, this is a hypnogram for the day. Um, and so it can detect when you're in this deep, slow wave sleep. And then what's really cool is when it does, in these earpieces, there are very small little speakers and those speakers can play very brief kind of tones that only you can hear, your partner wouldn't hear them, um, at very slow rhythms consistent with the kind of rhythm that you'd see in slow waves. And the idea is that you can actually boost these slow waves artificially just with sound. And it works. It actually works. This, this kind of audio feedback at slow rhythms actually has been shown multiple times to increase the number and the size of slow waves. And so this is a, a figure from one of those papers that Phillips has co-opted, where basically you can have this regular kind of random irregular uh, random irregular uh, activity beforehand and as soon as you start these auditory tones at very slow rhythmic frequencies what you can see right away is slow waves these slow waves just emerge from this kind of slow uh, regular stimulus and so that's really cool um, some studies have already shown that this actually leads to an improvement in, in in certain types of memory like we showed earlier with the nap group or the sleep group um, this kind of thing can enhance even beyond regular amounts of sleep 
Now, we're getting all this data, but it's not clear, in fact, what it's doing in terms of how restful your sleep is or a kind of longer term thing. But we're collecting a lot of data. And even the smartwatch that you might be wearing now can do some of this sleep tracking kind of thing. And you can, you can look at uh, your sleep quality and see how much deep sleep you're getting. And so it's a very exciting new technology that I'm, I, I can't wait to see where it goes, but it's certainly promising. My take home message here is that sleep is a profoundly active time for your brain. It's not just serving one single function, but a, a host of physiological, neurobiological things are going on that, that you might not even be aware of, that you slow wave sleep, especially this kind of deep sleep, is super important for so many things. Um, hopefully you believe me now that it's very good for memory and also has benefits for health, behavior, et cetera, uh, that you need this kind of deep, slow wave sleep. And so I would say prioritize, it. prioritize your sleep. Try not to stay up watching Wheel of Fortune. Again, don't really know. Um, try to actually really get that sleep and focus on that early slow wave sleep that you get. But rest easy. Your body knows what to do. The point of this talk isn't to make you stressed at 3 a.m. when you can't fall asleep, but to learn a little bit more about what's going on when you eventually do. Uh, feel free to reach out to me personally uh, if you have any questions about sleep or what I do. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well, uh, constantly sending out sleep-related things because I just love them. Um, I'll leave you with a few thoughts from W.C. Fields, who said famously that the best cure for insomnia is to get a lot of sleep. And so I hope you do that tonight and remember everything you learned here. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the Neuroscience Graduate Student Association here. who's done such an excellent job at this already uh, and for inviting me, as well as the Neuroscience and Mental Health Institute. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, and I'd be remiss not to thank my supervisors and lab mates in both the Brain Rhythms Lab and the Pagliardini Labs and NSERC for funding all of my wonderful research. Thank you so much. Next, we'll move on to our second talk by Dr. Richard Camicholi. Um, this talk is about activity to maintain your brain. Dr. Camicholi is currently a professor at the University of Alberta. He is also the director of the Cognitive Neurology Program and the co-director of the Movement Disorders Program. His major research interests <clears throat> are on markers of cognitive and functional decline in aging as well as in Parkinson's disease. And in this research, he employs a wide range of techniques from basic science to clinical science, uh, including genetics, imaging such as MRI, and movement or gait measures. So, uh, join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Camicholi. Hi right there, can you hear me? Yep, okay, great. Thanks very much and thanks for the invitation. It's really an honor to be invited by the Graduate Student Association. So what we'll focus on in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes is about um, ways to kind of protect your brain. Kind of, uh, I think sleep is a very important one and I'll, we'll, come, we'll come with the bottom line slide of the uh, recommendations from today. Uh, but uh, sleep is a really important one to keep in mind. Um, the left is Therese Yellhug skiing very fast, and on the right in the lower quadrant is me eating cookies. Actually, very few cookies left over after the cookie race and, um, and uh, our affiliations. So what are we trying to prevent? We want to age well, and uh, what is not normal? So there are actually a number of disorders that are associated with uh, not aging as well as we'd like. So Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease, which includes Parkinson's uh, disease and related disorders, there are other dementias. Other aging changes that can exist independently or together include vascular disease. So uh, Brendan mentioned uh, vascular changes that are improved by better sleep. So cerebral vascular disease, which includes brain disease, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, and there's other health conditions that also contribute to not aging as well as we'd like. So in terms of cognitive aging, uh, we all start out normal for us. And there's this, there are changes in some people uh, which we term mild cognitive impairment, where there's a change in your cognition more than you'd expect for age uh, that you can still cope with, but uh, eventually that may lead to dementia, which is a, where the cognitive impairment, thinking problems, actually interfere with your ability to function. And that's not a, a, a good quality state of life. So part of what we're going to talk about is how do we prevent that? What's normal? Uh, so this is a slide from a recent study looking at the normal age-related changes on a range of cognitive functions. So things like vocabulary. People's vocabulary actually does very well as we age, even into the 90s. Uh, there's some, uh, some consideration that this, this may even improve as we get older. Understanding, comprehension. Some tasks do 
get a little bit harder as we get older. So for example, uh, block design is a test where you have to arrange blocks in a certain pattern. So it's timed and you have to think spatially. Symbol search, similarly, you have to look at uh, uh, symbols and kind of pick them out uh, with, uh, with a timed component. So time tasks tend to slow down as, or become more difficult as we age. So this is normal. And usually you can cope with this. You just go a little bit slower, take your time, you can get around it. So this is what normal aging. And if you're beyond that normal pattern of aging, this is what we would call mild cognitive impairment. It's common. So about a quarter of people over 80 have mild cognitive impairment. About half again would have dementia, which is the more concerning aspect. And um, this, so this may be an opportunity to to prevent the progression to dementia. And again, it increases as we get older and older. One of the other changes that you may uh, recognize, some people if you're getting older, is that we slow down. This is just to, to remind me to tell you that actually our walking speed does get slower uh, with an inflection point, with, a, with, a, with an increased slowing in the 60s. Um, the similarly, and this is reflected in decreased uh, length of stepping and, uh, st and a little bit more imbalance. So this is another fundamental age change that goes along with the cognitive change. So are these at all related? This is the next point. And this is a study on the left that uh, Joe Vergesi did. Um, Joe Vergesi did a number of studies looking at uh, leisure activities and how these may be uh, participating in leisure activities and socialization may prevent uh, age-related cognitive decline. What he found was that if somebody uh, notes some, uh, is somebody is healthy and you, you still can develop cognitive decline as you get older, but if you have, if you're healthy, if, but if you are noticing memory problems and you slow down walking, you're at double the risk of developing cognitive decline and actually double the risk of developing dementia. So the slowing with walking may have some impact on our uh, ability to maintain our thinking function. This is a, so this is another study by another colleague, Manuel Montero Adasso. Um, I'm included in this study because we started looking at this kind of issue years ago and he kind of kindly included me. So what we, he looked at was we directly looked at uh, people walking and talking at the same time. So that's a tough thing to do. And if you actually slow down a lot when you talk and walk, you're actually, uh, that basically also doubles your risk of developing dementia over time. And this was people who already had a little bit of cognitive impairment. This is actually useful as a diagnostic test, but also a, a kind of a, we can think safety wise, if you're having some cognitive difficulties, don't walk and talk at the same time. Um, so I think this is sort of two messages. One, we can sort of see that the mobility changes are kind of associated with the cognitive changes. This is another uh, paper by Manuel, and I, I mention it because uh, there are health factors that increase the likelihood that both your mobility and thinking may decline. And uh, things that uh, this study identified included um, high blood pressure, uh, smoking is a problem, um, some genetic factors, and uh, high cholesterol. So these things are actually things that you uh, like health maintenance can help uh, get you around. So main, you know, may, taking blood medications for hypertension if you need it. And so I think this is an important message is we have to keep uh, engaged in our general health measures to prevent decline. Dual decliners refer to decline both in cognition and thinking and, and mobility. If you walk fast enough, you can outpace the Grim Reaper. This is a, a, a study that was meant to be a bit humorous in the uh, British Medical Journal. What they found is if you're really, really slow, your chances of dying are not as, are, 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 are good, which is not a good thing. So again, this we can improve cognition by by mobility uh, uh, by mobility interventions, but also we can have a longer life. This is a study that we're part of, and uh, it was. Uh, 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 supported by the uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research, where we're trying to look at diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease and related disorders, and people with mild cognitive impairment. Uh, and we're looking at them together. We're looking, we, people who could volunteer for the project can, can be anywhere in the picture. There's a lot of studies that focus just on one disease, really don't appreciate or don't uh, recognize that actually a lot of the brain changes actually overlap. These are overlapping brain changes. So um, again, we, try, we did a study that just recently uh, finished where we kind of asked, well, what about mobility distinguishes between these different disorders? And this is just a graph from it. 
what we found was actually variability. So if you take long steps, short steps, and you're really unsteady, you actually are more likely to have cognitive impairment. And, and actually the two disorders that were most associated with this walking variability were Alzheimer's disease and people with Parkinson's, but only those people with Parkinson's who actually had dementia. Um, so actually this is a test that we can actually, if you had a, uh, you can't do it with just a stopwatch. You have to have something that's measuring your steps, actually accelerometers that you find in your phone can do this. That may be a way to kind of distinguish uh, somebody who's at, who's got more serious cognitive impairment. So how do we prevent all this from happening? Well, it, it, to risk factors for poor cognitive health include some of the vascular risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, head injuries, which are best avoided, smoking. Air pollution has actually become something that, that people are learning about as a potential risk factor for cognitive decline and ob obesity. This was mentioned in the previous talk as well. What protects you? So frequent exercise, treating depression, recognizing it and treating it, and avoiding excessive alcohol. These are the sorts of things you can do actually to prevent dementia and potentially to, uh, to avoid the brain changes that lead to dementia. Some of these changes can, for example, for increased exercise, improving hearing impairments, social contact, and high education. So again, learning stuff over time. People here are learning stuff, I hope. Increase cognitive reserve, which can prevent dementia. And some of the things can also prevent the brain pathologies that lead to dementia. One of the, uh, so the question was, how do we do that? How do we improve this? So this is another uh, study by Manuel, uh, where, which I'm an a, a advisor on, where we're actually looking at exercise and trying to see if exercise can prevent people who are having mild cognitive impairment from progressing to more severe cognitive impairment. So uh, exercise can improve blood supply, it can improve neuronal connectivity, it can improve how the brain adapts to change and how the neurons communicate with each other and how well the brain is organized at a microscopic level. And so that's what this study is, is uh, intending to do. There are a number of studies that have been published. So a few studies have looked at uh, exercise in the context of other ways, including some of the health factors I talked to, I talked to you about and uh, to prevent dementia. One study called the Finger Study from um, uh, based in Finland uh, used exercise and it was positive. It actually showed that people who are at risk for cognitive decline based on all the things I've just talked about were less likely to develop dementia if we did a number of things, including exercise. A couple of studies did not show the same thing. The MAP-T Prediva study did not show that, and it's not clear why. So this is where uh, there's still ongoing research, and so now there's a finger network, and the Canadian study, just to be different, is calling our network Can Thumbs Up, which is trying to develop a lifestyle intervention and exercise program to prevent dementia. One study that uh, was recently published and was successful in, in, in improving risk factors for dementia. They actually didn't show they improved dementia a risk, a dementia uh, beginning, but they showed that they improved risk factors, was called the Body Brain Life Program from Australia. So what they did was an online intervention to including um, some brain training, a brain HQ training, but for exercise and diet, they actually had people see a dietitian and uh, get a trainer basically to help them initiate a training program. And the risk factors they looked at are a number of the ones we just showed on the previous slide, the, the, the figure. So what they found was by doing this intervention, they actually improved risk so that the, those things that are risk factors for dementia decreased. But actually nicely, they also showed that they improved how people's thinking was. They, people had better thinking performance if, if they participated in this, in this program, which was mostly online, except for the exercise physiologist. One of the th things that they found in this study was that the the brain training exercises, people didn't participate in. Uh, some people continued, but most people didn't. But the exercise program and the diet changes were definitely there, and then people do reduce their risk profile. Does the brain change? So this is just a review that looked at a, studies that either used um, uh, uh, intervention where people did something different than they used to do, or just general fitness, or just general physical activity. And what this study is, is, is a summary of all the literature showing that actually brain changes do occur whether you're just, whether you're older, or whether you actually have Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. So in other words, exercise or activity can actually change the brain in a positive way. 
this is a study that looked directly at Alzheimer's risk. And what they did was they took people who were at risk for Alzheimer's disease and they identified that by a scan that showed that the brain had Alzheimer changes uh, using an amyloid PET scan. Amyloid is a protein we find in the brain. And they found that people who had lower physical activity had, with a lot of amyloid declined, got worse and worse over time. Whereas those with more physical activity, despite having a high load of amyloid, actually maintained how they did. And then uh, similarly, they looked at uh, brain volumes. And this is just summarized down in the, on the bottom of the slide, where they showed areas that were spared and that actually were maintained in terms of, uh, in terms of volume or structure with uh, the activity. Remember, we mentioned vascular disease a couple of times. So vascular disease is related to high risk factors like high blood pressure and diabetes. And on the, on the left, we have a study we just published looking at vascular disease and aging and, and Parkinson's disease. And on the right is a study by Fleischmann where they asked people's um, physical activity level. And they found that despite looking at the bottom, despite having lots of vascular disease changes, the patients could move better if they had high, high physical activity measured by uh, a Fitbit-like watch over a, uh, over a seven-day period. So the bottom line is, okay, maybe we can't optimally manage our risk factors, but if we stay active, we may be able to fight them off. So not only can, might we fight, be able to fight off Alzheimer changes, but also these vascular changes. This is uh, switching to Parkinson's disease. I brought this up because even if you have a neurologic disorder, such as Parkinson's disease, exercise may be helpful. So this is a study by Dan Korkos, where he actually did a resistance training uh, exercise. And we, he found that people who did the resistance training in this study actually did, uh, the red line is they didn't get worse in terms of their Parkinson's function, whereas those who didn't do the res resistance training, when they entered the study, they got a little bit better, probably just because of their being a little bit more motivated, but they got worse over time. So this was a, a study of people with Parkinson's disease. And uh, we did a study in, um, that just finished last year and is published by uh, Jacqueline Burt and me, uh, where we used a, um, an, um, a device to encourage people to take bigger steps, to normalize people's steps, to have them walk faster. And we didn't find a, a big effect on cognition, but we actually found an, an impact on mood and anxiety. So patients become less anxious and had better mood. And on the, on the right is a, a recent study by another group where they showed that uh, they looked at anxiety and mood as a risk factor for uh, cognitive decline. This is a risk factor for people with Parkinson's developing dementia and progressing. And they found that those with high activity had uh, less um, a better mood, so that's sort of a, so they kind of fit with what we found, and less anxiety, but also better markers for degeneration of the brain, better markers of Alzheimer's disease, which also occur in Parkinson's. We're doing a study which we're hoping to get started, although COVID is interfering with that, where we're actually going to recruit people with Parkinson's disease who aren't yet on medications to see if exercise. Uh, can prevent you needing medication. But eventually, though, people will need medications, but can we actually improve people's outcome and, and keep them from going on medications that they might not need? So we are actually a site on this study, and uh, we're getting things ramped up so that we can actually uh, get going on this exercise study in people with Parkinson's who aren't treated. So what do we recommend these days? Recommendations for physical activity are 150 to 3. Uh, 100 minutes a week of moderate activity that's slight uh, or 75 minutes of vigorous activity and don't sit too much we'll try to get up every hour and so moderate re refers to things like brisk walking bicycling running those would be uh, or uh, bicycling vigorous includes things like cross-country skiing uh, swimming and, and running uh, and then the recommendations are to stand one to two minutes every hour uh, every hour at least um, so try not to sit too much Actually, the recommendations are fairly consistent from the World Health Organization, the U.S., the Australian recommendations, and these are the Canadian recommendations here. These uh, the recommendation for physical activity to maintain cognitive health is part of actually the new Canadian Consensus Conference recommendations on prevention of dementia. So again, I think there's enough out there that staying active is really important uh, uh, to, to do. And... Uh, I personally wouldn't wait for clinical trials to prove it, but we are trying to prove it in people who are having a little bit of trouble getting motivated for activity. This is the, uh, the, the recent, the most recent channel challenge is COVID. 
So this is a, a great uh, study where they people people looked at uh, the the Dr. Tisson looked at people's uh, phones which monitored activity, and as you can see, the activities is basically mean daily steps. We can see that in the U.S. there's a huge drop in uh, physical activity with COVID. Uh, and, and that was fairly consistent around the United States. This is sort of different ways of looking at the same thing. And, um, and this has changed from baseline. So people drop their physical activity from what they were normally doing. Worldwide, actually, a lot of variability. Some, some places like Korea, uh, South Korea, uh, pay, people maintain their physical activity a little bit better. Of course, they had a very low COVID rate. And so that was the sort of uh, thing. So I think what the message here is there's always going to be challenges regarding physical activity and uh, social activity and diet. And so we have to kind of consciously try to see if we can get around these barriers, uh, try to do something at home, do social activity by joining a Zoom class for, for, for mobility. So this is kind of my last slide. Uh, I wanted to main make sure we were on time. And this is the Lancet Commission's recommendation. So the Lancet uh, had a group of experts get together several years ago. So they had a recommendation in 2017, and this is their latest recommendation. And what they predict is that if we can change all our modifiable risk factors, all these things that contribute to risk for dementia, you might actually be able to you know, modify 40% of the risk of developing dementia by things like, you know, education programs. Hearing loss is important. I, again, I, 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 um, I uh, was, you know, I'm, uh, I emphasize physical activity, but hearing loss, avoiding brain injuries, treating those risk factors, high blood pressure, not drinking too much, modest alcohol is not bad, weight control. Um, smoking is a very strong risk factor, especially if we consider uh, the world at large. So and smoking is a very strong risk factor for dementia. Mood, helping people's mood. And then social isolation, of course, which is being, being uh, attacked by COVID in a sense. And so uh, I, I Zoom uh, meetings and things like that aren't perfect, but they may be better than uh, being alone. Uh, physical inactivity is a, is a risk factor as well. Air pollution is the new one that came on the map. And actually, there are Canadian studies suggesting people who live near highways uh, are at higher risk for dementia. I think we're actually fortunate at Edmonton. There's not as much pollution and population density. And then diabetes. Uh, sleep isn't mentioned on this. I think with time and actually in the Canadian recommendations, we actually do talk about sleep hygiene and sleep as being an important factor to consider as a dementia risk. And uh, with that, I think we're pretty much on time and I will, uh, I will wrap. Our next speaker is Dr. Sheree Kwong Si, and she'll be speaking about ageism on the brain today. <clears throat> so Dr. Kwong Si is a Canadian expert uh, on the psychology of aging and is also a professor of psychology at the University of Alberta. She conducts her research on cognitive aging and the development and impact of age stereotyping and ageism in real world contexts. She is also an award-winning instructor and administrator, and she was appointed by the government of Alberta to serve as the Alberta Seniors Advocate from 2016 to 2019. So with that, I will let Dr. Kwong Si take it away. Thanks very much for the um, introduction. Um, and let me get my, my screen up here. So for this part of the, um, I just wanna start a timer as well. So for this part of the panel, I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna look and tell you about research that's looking at the impact of social or societal influences on health, including brain health. So we're gonna talk about ageism and what it means to have ageism on the brain. In the brief time that we have together, I'm gonna to do this. I'm gonna talk about ageism. What is it and why is it? And then I'm gonna talk about what the research says about why ageism matters um, in two ways, for intergenerational interactions, that is interactions between younger people and older people, and then importantly, how, uh, what the research says about how ageism matters for the health and well-being of older people. Convincing you then that ageism matters, we're going to end with a few words about what's the call to action. If we believe that ageism matters, what as a society uh, do we need to do? So let's talk about um, moving toward solutions. 
Now, for us to get on the same page of understanding what ageism is, <clears throat> we have to uh, be on the same page with respect to terminology. So when I speak of stereotypes, I'm referring to collections of beliefs that we have about stigmatized groups. Now, stereotypes in and of themselves are not a bad thing. They are a characteristic of human information processing to take lots of information and condense it into usable chunks. Okay? So stereotypes refer to collections of beliefs that we have about stigmatized groups. So you may have a collection of beliefs, for example, uh, about women who are, are blonde. The problem with stereotypes is that the beliefs that you have uh, become overgeneralized, and that is you believe that they uh, apply more broadly than they do, um, you believe that they are more encompassing than they are. Um, so these overgeneralized beliefs are problematic in that if they guide your interaction with a member of that stigmatized group, you're likely to miss the mark because nobody fits the stereotype, okay? Completely fits the stereotype. So if you have collections of beliefs, attitudes refer to how you feel about those beliefs. So uh, if you have a belief that aging is associated with a decline in memory, you may feel that, uh, about that positively or negatively. When you behave in line with your beliefs and attitudes about those beliefs, that's when we enter the realm of isms, sexism, racism, ageism. So what do we know about stereotypes associated with age? Well, the study of what it is that we believe about older people and the aging process is one of the most well-researched areas in the social gerontological literature. Um, you can go all the way back to the 1950s to see research being done on what it is that we believe about aging and, and the, aging, the aging process in older people. What this um, research shows us is that, in fact, we do have age stereotypes and that those stereotypes are multifaceted. That is, we have positive age stereotypes, so we associate age with things like wisdom, enhanced vocabulary, good storytelling, honesty, benevolence. Um, but we also have negative stereotypes associating age with slowness, senility, poor memory, verbosity, um, physical decline. Um, big ones are dependency um, and sickness or illness. So we've got both positive and negative stereotypes, but there are more negative stereotypes in our society than there are positive stereotypes. And it's the negative stereotypes that are activated first. As well, we know that the stereotypes are activated and work together. So for example, um, if you are looking at an older person on the witness stand, um, you've got positive and negative age stereotypes at play. So you might say, oh, this person um, is really uh, an honest person. They would never lie but they have poor memory, okay? So you have these two uh, positive and negative stereotypes playing off each other. So plenty of research suggesting that we do in fact have age stereotypes. So with that background then, we can define ageism. Ageism actually is a term that was uh, coined by uh, geriatrician Robert Butler in the 1960s, but it remains and is a contemporary issue today. Ageism, the term, refers to stereotyping of and the prejudice and discrimination against older people and the aging process. Okay, so it's that stereotyping and prejudice leads to behaviors that are ageist. Okay, how do we see ageism? We see it manifested in what our beliefs are about older people and the aging process, in attitudes, in expectations of older people, in attributions that we make about uh, older people's behavior, and what we do um, when we interact with um, older people. You also can see ageism in policy, um, but that's a, that's a topic for another talk. Okay, so that's ageism. So why is it that ageism exists? Well, the number of uh, explanations have been presented in the literature, I'm gonna talk about a few. Um, one of them has to do with the fear of death that we have and this uh, repulsion of death that we have in our culture. So um, older people by virtue of where they are in the lifetime are statistically closer to death. And as a result, because uh, we have this in, 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 um, inherent fear of death, younger people tend to shun older people because older people remind uh, younger people of their own mortality. So fear of death is one reason why ageism uh, might exist. 
Another reason has to do with what we value in our society. And you just simply have to look at any um, magazine, TV show, movie to see what is valued in terms of what is strong and what is beautiful. It tends to be associated with youth. Okay, so our societal emphasis on youth uh, may be one of the reasons that ageism exists. And a, a final reason I want to highlight is age segregation. That is, it's a fundamental uh, truth, so to speak, that in general, um, younger people tend to hang out with younger people and older people tend to hang out with older people, uh, not exclusively but in general. And as a result, younger people do not have as much interaction with older people to be able to see the heterogeneity that there is in the older age category. So if you aren't exposed to older people, you rely on the stereotypes and myths that you have about aging, as opposed to really seeing the heterogeneity and the variability that's there to know that the stereotypes uh, are probably not a good guide for you to guide your behavior with older people. Okay, so those are some of the reasons that have been proposed as to why ageism exists. So what about that discrimination? Um, if you ask seniors, um, you see that uh, a non-trivial number of seniors will report discrimination and uh, what they believe is prejudice. So for example, this Rivera report, um, you can see here that older people, a non-trivial a percentage of older people say that they have been ignored or treated as if they are invisible, um, that other people have assumed um, that uh, seniors have nothing to contribute, or that other people um, have assumed that I'm incompetent. Okay? So we have these stereotypes and seniors report that they, are, um, they experience ageism in everyday life. Now the research um, had various ebbs and flows and shifts. Um, and there was a lot of research done on documenting what it is that we believe about older people and the aging process. And then the research shifted to asking, well, how does ageism matter? How, how is it important for intergenerational interactions? And this is where, uh, when I have done work in this area, most of my work has been focused, looking to see how those stereotypes matter for intergenerational interactions. So what we know is that uh, younger people have stereotypes, and as a result, in interactions with older people, there is bias in interpretation of older people's behavior in line with those stereotypes. So it, it is as if uh, younger people have stereotyped glasses, and when they are observing an older person, um, that the behaviors of, of an older person are filtered through those stereotypes. That is, there is a bias in in looking at, at older people's behavior, bias and in the interpretation of older people's behavior. So for example, some of the work we've done has shown that if I were to present to you a piece of discourse, a piece of communication, um, the exact same communication, um, but you think that that communication is produced by someone younger or older, those stereotypes will drive you to interpret and to evaluate that piece of discourse or that, communi or that communication in line with stereotypes typically not positively, okay? Um, or with respect to contexts like eyewitness testimony, um, some of the work we've done is we've looked at um, eyewitness testimony, the exact same eyewitness testimony, and have told people that it's coming from someone younger or coming from someone older. And then we look to see how do you evaluate the person who's giving you the testimony and are they credible, are they believable? And what we find is that through these stereotype glasses, younger people are um, more likely to rate the older eyewitness as um, having poor memory, but high honesty. Um, and because of the playoff of those two stereotypes to be less credible, that is grandma, um, certainly isn't, she's an honest person, she sure, certainly isn't lying on the witness stand, but too bad she doesn't remember. And hence, older witnesses, the credibility of their testimony, at least as suggested in this study, um, was not as high. We've also started looking at how stereotypes can influence um, health care that older people receive and potentially uh, explain some aspects of abuse. Some of the other work that we have done um, has looked at how early does this ageism start? So some of the work that we've done um, with, um, on average, three-year-olds and five-year-olds tell us that uh, by looking at how these children are interacting with a younger or older actor, that not only do children have and know cultural stereotypes, 
stereotypes of aging um, that are prominent in our culture, but they use those stereotypes to guide their interactions with older people. So there's an early start to ageism and even young children in some of our studies we're seeing evidence of this as early as age three so even young children show this bias in interaction with older adults that is even young children um, use stereotype glasses to look at older people's behavior um, and to interpret older people's behavior and use those stereotypes to guide interactions with older people I want to focus a little bit more now on um, some work that we're currently doing. And I want to highlight this because what this work shows is that there are kind of groups or classes of stereotypes about older people, meaning there are not only stereotypes about what it is to grow older, but there are stereotypes of uh, what you are like if you are living with a dementia. And we're interested in how some of those um, dementia, age-related dementia stereotypes um, influence interactions. So this is a study that uh, we're writing up. We're moving it from the point of being presentations at conferences to uh, a paper that we can get out. Um, but over a couple of studies, uh, this is what we were interested in and this is what we found. So the, the question that we were interested in was this. Um, the reality is that older adults in care who have a dementia are more likely to be abused than older adults in care without a dementia. Okay. Now we did find in earlier research um, that when we looked at people's beliefs about normal aging and dementia, there were dementia stereotypes. That is, in, those, in the previous study, we found that people expect a person with dementia to have poor memory, no surprise there, relative to uh, normal aging, but also to have superhuman strength. Uh, that is, persons with dementia are seen as uh, physically more robust or stronger than normal aging, probably coming from the, the the finding that you find older people um, with dementia wandering for many miles and you think, wow, they must be superhuman, okay? So we were interested in if there is a role for these age-related dementia stereotypes um, in explaining why older persons with dementia might be more likely to be abused. So if you think about how these stereotypes might play out, if you think that older persons with dementia are physically strong, uh, you might um, believe that in your interactions with an older person, you might have to be more forceful and perhaps even cross the line because we've got an older person who's out of their mind um, and very strong, so you have to be forceful. Or if you believe in uh, that older persons with uh, dementia have very poor memory, then maybe the interaction that you're having here doesn't matter so much if it crosses the line and is abusive because the next time you see them won't matter, they won't remember it anyway. Okay? So that was our rationale. So to try to understand the role of these age-related uh, dementia stereotypes, um, we did this. So we had younger adults uh, watch a real video clip of an abusive exchange. So this was a clip that we took um, from the internet. It was posted uh, and it was a family uh, who recorded abusive incidents because they were concerned about what was happening to their parent in care. So these were real abusive exchanges um, by, with real people, okay? So we took those video clips and we presented them to young adults and we had them rate um, the caregiver and the care recipient in the exchange um, on a number of characteristics. Critically, we manipulated the cognitive status, um, the care recipient's status. So some people thought that the person was in care because they had an Alzheimer's dementia, so the, they were cognitively unhealthy or cognitively unwell. Some people saw the exchange and thought that the care recipient um, was in care because they had a physical reason for being there. They had diabetes um, or a broken hip. Okay, so they were physically healthy, physically uh, unhealthy, but cognitively healthy. Okay, so we were interested in what are the differences in perceptions. This is what we found. We found that with respect to the abused care recipient, um, we found that uh, the care recipient was perceived as lower in physical and cognitive competence when cognitively unhealthy versus healthy. So we didn't replicate the superhuman person with dementia um, finding that we had before. Our person um, who was being abused was seen as more uh, frail, okay? So lower physical and cognitive competence um, when cognitively unhealthy versus uh, healthy. But this is what's critical. 
when the caregiver, um, the abusive caregiver, when we looked at perceptions of this person, generally, the abusive caregiver was perceived more positively, that is more respectful, nurturing, competent, benevolent, when the care recipient was perceived to be cognitively unhealthy versus healthy. Okay. So what this means is what we, what we think this means in our study is that abuse is perceived with more leniency or forgiveness when the recipient has a dementia. So we believe that this, um, this suggests that there's a possible role for age-related dementia stereotypes um, as uh, playing some uh, part in why older people with dementia are more likely to be abused in care. So when I said that the research uh, switches directions, um, there has been a switch um, in direction in the research literature around ageism as well, in that there has been an explosion of research in the last few years looking to see that ageism matters for the older uh, recipients of, of ageism, so that ageism matters for the actual health and well-being of older people. So a recent uh, review of um, the number of studies that are out there now looking at the impacts of ageism on health um, shows, and the review covers uh, studies that have, if you look at all the participants, over 7 million people have been in these studies. Um, and the result is quite clear that ageism um, has been found to have a detrimental, uh, have, to have detrimental consequences on the health and well being of older people. How is it that? Uh, that ageism impacts health. One mechanism that you can think about is um, stereotype internalization. Okay, what do I mean by that? So if you are an older person who knew the stereotypes as a child and acted upon those stereotypes as a child, as an adult, you use those stereotypes to gauge and to uh, be biased in your, inter in your interactions with older people. And now all of a sudden, you become the older person who becomes the recipient of ageism. Those stereotypes that you knew as children and acted upon in adulthood become self-relevant to you. They become part of your identity. And this is a way to think about um, people becoming stereotypically old and having this, the social environment shape you in becoming stereotypically old. It explains why people go from saying, uh, when in middle uh, adulthood, when you forget something, you say, I'm so busy and distracted, to when you're older and you forget something and you say, oh, my memory, in my memory must be going, I'm old, I'm getting old, I'm having a senior's moment. How does that shift happen? Um, this would suggest a role for social influences in becoming stereotypically old. That is, you have um, ageism on the brain. Okay? Um, behaviors can be impacted, in, including health behaviors, because if you are, if you've internalized stereotypes and you're put into a situation um, where that stereotype is relevant, so you're going for memory testing, for example, and you have beliefs about memory declining, it's like your worst fears are realized, and when you are, your worst fears are realized, it can actually impact um, performance related to that stereotype. As well, stereotypes that you have or beliefs about aging um, can decrease motivation to do something different, and it uh, filters or creates these self-fulfilling prophecies. So when I told you there is uh, an explosion of research out there, I just wanna um, conclude really with um, telling you some isolated results to demonstrate for you just how much we know now about how ageism can impact health. So it talks about some physical effects and then some cognitive and mental effects. Most of these studies are from Bacalibi's lab um, and they take this form. I mean, there are some studies that prime positive or negative age stereotypes and they look at outcomes, but most of this work comes from a longitudinal studies where early on um, there have been measures of people's views about aging and perceptions about aging um, and we can take those perceptions about the aging process of, of people um, early on and look over time to see what the outcomes are of holding more positive or negative views of aging okay and what has been found so with respect to physical health People with more positive self-perceptions of aging have been found to practice more preventative health behaviors, such as eating balanced diets, exercising, over the next two decades. More negative age stereotypes have been found to be associated with a greater likelihood of hospitalization. 
people holding negative stereotypes are more likely to experience a cardiovascular event in the next 38 years. People holding more negative and external age stereotypes demonstrated poorer hearing ability. Okay. Implicit interventions where you prime people um, with positive age stereotypes have been found to strengthen not only self positive self-perceptions of aging, but this has also been found to increase or to better physical function. Um, and in fact, um, when comparing uh, uh, an exercise intervention, this priming of positive age stereotypes um, possibly results in better health outcomes um, than an exercise intervention. And there are also longevity effects such that people with more positive self-perceptions of aging have been found um, when you measure it um, up to 23 years earlier, they have been found to live on average about seven and a half years longer than those with less positive perceptions of aging. Moving to the to brain health, cognitive and, and um, mental health, we find that those with more negative age stereotypes demonstrated significantly worse memory performance over 38 years than those with less negative stereotypes. Okay? Even with respect to Alzheimer's biomarkers, such as uh, tangles and plaques, older adults found to hold more negative age stereotypes earlier in life had significantly steeper hippocampal volume loss and significantly greater uh, accumulations of tangles and plaques. Okay. And in older age, self-perceptions of aging um, have been found to partially mediate the relationship between hopelessness and depressive symptoms. Okay. So I hope that you are convinced that um, like we know for other isms, ageism um, has consequences for people's health and well-being. So what's the call to action then? Well, this research has spurred an understanding that there is a need for action. The World Health Organization's um, International Day of the Older Persons theme in 2006 was take a stand against ageism. And this is coming out of the research showing us that ageism does matter. So based on what I talked about today, um, well, how do we move forward to solutions? Uh, just a few things here for us to be thinking about. Um, the step fast forward, I believe, uh, are to increase awareness about ageism, like we are doing in venues like this today. Okay? So understanding what ageism is and being convinced and understanding how and why ageism matters for intergenerational interactions and for the health and well-being of older people themselves. Okay? How do we start to break down some of those stereotypes of aging? Well, it's looking to see where the origins of the stereotypes come from. Where are the reinforcements for the stereotypes? And those are the images that we have of aging and older people in our society. So we should be promoting more realistic and balanced images of aging rather than the stereotypical uh, images that we know exist. And some of the work that we've done clearly suggests that ageism has an early start with children in seeing the stereotypes and using the stereotypes in their interactions with older people, which means that we need to start intervening early. So as children are learning about some of those other isms like sexism and racism, um, it's time that, that in the curriculum, um, children are starting to understand and read about um, at the impacts of ageism as well. So just revisiting what I said we were gonna do, I hope you now have a better understanding of ageism, what it is and why it is, and that you are convinced from the research that ageism matters for intergenerational interactions and for the health and well-being of older people, and that you're starting to think about what you might do uh, in your everyday life to uh, eradicate ageism.